There is considerable scholarship now based, and I consider that scholarship to be based on critical evaluation of primary and secondary sources. But it's also obvious that in some cases, uh, polemical and politicized outlooks influence the narratives. Different schools have emerged, I'll talk about three of them initially, and each of these schools, in my opinion, come with their own problems, or colloquially to speak, with their own baggage. Secondly, and I don't know how this will fit in exactly, but you know, the way in which the Holocaust enters the national narrative, and here I'm talking about Lithuania, is obviously affected by the remembered experiences of the people. I mean, historical writing inevitably arises from and thus is inevitably affected by the experiences, memories, and biases of the society in which it is practiced. In fact, it would be quite strange if historians remain unaffected by their own past, that is, the experiences of the community from which they spring. All three Baltic nations experienced violent transformations of their societies from 1940 to the 1950s, the memory of which has been internalized by very large segments of the populations of both. <coughs> a grasp of the lived experience of war and occupation by the Lithuanian people, and here I have in mind the ethnic Lithuanian people during the mid-20th century, is crucial to understanding how the narrative of the Holocaust evolved within the country itself, particularly in the post-independence period I have in mind since the late 1980s and 1990. The Holocaust in Lithuania occurred within the context of wartime and post-war experiences, which differed sharply from those endured by people outside of the region, which has recently been christened as the bloodlands. It is my contention that this experiential gap, this difference, has yet to sufficiently, sufficiently inform Western historians and their reading publics. Um, uh, let us start by uh, briefly outlining, and I've done this last time we are here, so I, I uh, apologize for repetition, uh, what I call narratives of old. Uh, now, in fact, uh, before independence, and, and in fact, the commemoration of the Holocaust in Lithuania began as early as 1944, when the Lithuanian Jewish Museum, which was the only such institution in the USSR, it was founded by returning survivors who organized I think the very first post-war exhibition of the genocide was called The Brutal Destruction of the Jews During the German Occupation. This, however, did not last. And in June 1949, the Soviet Lithuanian government reorganized cultural institutions and effectively closed this museum. So consequently, in addition to the lo numerous local memorials in the country which commemorate the annihilation of peaceful Soviet citizens, uh, the Jewish specificity of the Holocaust was pretty much, I think, diminished, uh, with the exception partly with the very impressive Panereo Ponare and the Ninth Fort Memorials. These were the sole venues for at least a limited exploration of the Jewish specificity, the specificity of the Nazi genocide. And this, for all practical purposes, ended any meaningful investigation of the Holocaust within Lithuania during the Soviet period, with some minor exceptions. Um, now, as far as historical literature is concerned, I look at three views of the 20th Holocaust, which dominated until the late 1980s and are, to some extent, minor extent, still relevant. And now, allowing for simplification, I, I divide them into <coughs> Soviet, Western, including Jewish, and then Lithuanian perspectives, such as they were at the time. Now, Soviet narratives, very briefly, emphasized, of course, the service of Lithuanian bourgeois nationalism to the Nazi cause. And its main purpose was political, to discredit the anti-communist diaspora in the West, and also to discredit the post-war armed struggle against the Soviet occupation. And this anti-emigre propaganda began to sort of reach the peak somewhere in the 60s and 70s, and also concluded with very high-profile trials of former police battalion members involved in the mass shootings of the Jews. There was a limited recognition of the Jewish genocide, in some works, there was, for example, a very fine book uh, called uh, uh, Soldiers Without Weapons in the Hintlo Kare, which dealt with rescuers. And it was, for the time, 1960s, fairly objective and informative. Uh, but most of the Jewish struggle against the Nazis is conflated with the, with the communist sort of framework at the time. Uh, so, in any case, uh, this narrative 
obviously met some resistance among the population at large. And parts of that narrative, particularly the narrative of the Red Army as liberator, played very poorly for understandable reasons. Uh, I should add that during the Putin era, some of this kind of historiography has revived. Uh, and uh, just to, uh, there's recent Russian collection of documents, for example, uh, insinuates that the Zionist movement of the late 1980s is somehow has a connection with this Nazi past and is threatening the Russian minority. Uh, actually, I was at a conference in Berlin uh, a few weeks ago, and there were people from a uh, institute where the historian Alexander Dupov is prominent. And this is a sort of a, a slick and nuanced uh, apologia for Stalinism. Uh, they gave me some literature. Uh, and their sort of narrative, I think, also has this politicized sort of aim. Uh, so this is one of these narratives. I mean, the Soviet version suffered from its obvious transparent political agenda. Uh, we've spoken about that before. Um, now, the thing was that after the collapse of the USSR, the Lithuanians were disoriented to discover an outside world which had very little resemblance to either the pre-war West, which is in the memory of older people, or to the communist image of evil capitalism. In any case, there's also the Western and Jewish accounts of Lithuania's wartime history, and that, of course, focused on the fate of the Jews, understandably. And this inevitably uh, shone the spotlight on native collaboration to the, uh, in the final solution. <coughs> um, a continuing problem of this sort of Western scholarship is the unfamiliarity of most non-Baltic researchers with the indigenous languages and the materials that are now available uh, in the way itself. The mass of primary documents is, is huge. Uh, there is a, you know, a publication, a kind of archival directory of certain collections in the Lithuania Central State Archive dealing with the Holocaust, and I looked through it, but it's only a part of it. And by my sort of very rough arithmetic calculations, I think the number of pages of archival documents currently in Lithuanian archives and collections, including the special archive and so on, probably is between half a million to a million pages. Very little of this actually has been accessed by Western researchers for understandable reasons. Now, uh, I should say that, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll speak about this uh, maybe uh, as I get to another point in my presentation. Uh, which is uh, got some problems with these schools. Uh, I talked about the third narrative, which I say in quotations is Lithuanian, although it really isn't. And that is the narrative of the genocide which has emerged among emigres between the late 1940s and independence, or the late 1980s, when censorship for all practical purposes ceased in Lithuania. Um, and this was, of course, a denial and apologia narrative, uh, because most of these Lithuanians who fled to the West they numbered about 60 to 70,000, including my parents. Uh, they sort of had a unique view of the war. They were trapped between Stalin and Hitler. They prayed that the war would end in the same way the First World War had ended. That is, the Germans would defeat Russia and the Western Allies would defeat Germany, and that would restore the status quo ante that they enjoyed in the interwar period, the golden age in their minds. Um, this was the only fantasy which made sense to these people in terms of escaping what the situation they found themselves in. The majority of these Lithuanian embrace could not accept the Western narrative of the war, denied the Lithuanians had participated in their admittedly auxiliary role in genocide, and they proved largely immune to any serious analysis of the Holocaust for four decades, with some minor exceptions, some exceptions. In the late 1970s, 1978, I believe, there was a meeting uh, in uh, Michigan by a liberal Lithuanian group which openly, for the first time, began to question certain stereotypes and misconceptions about the Holocaust. And so, but they were, of course, immediately accused of being Soviet agents, if not worse. Uh, this was the uh, narrative which said that only a handful of rabble participated in the Holocaust on the Lithuanian side. Now, uh, and particularly in the late 1980s, because of the operation of the U.S. Justice Department, and accusations against primarily Lithuanian and Ukrainian DPs of participation in genocide, this evoked a kind of a defensive response, which further diminished any prospect for sort of insightful, reflective consideration of what had happened to the Jews during the war. I think, though, coming to uh, a certain, concluding this very first part of my paper, uh, 
I think that all three of these schools that I've mentioned are, have reached the point of diminishing returns primarily because none of them have used the materials and resources that are currently available in Lithuania for a detailed, uh, insightful, and very uh, sort of in-depth uh, examination of the Holocaust. The Soviet, Russian, and diaspora Lithuanian narratives are clearly not credible much anymore, uh, although the semigrey narrative still resonates among some people in Lithuania, I must say. It's still there, but it has lost some of its panache. Uh, on the other hand, the limitations of Western scholarship are also now uh, familiar. I can give two examples of very recent works. Uh, one is a book by Karen Sutton called The Massacre of the Jews in Lithuania, which <laughs> was published in 2008, you see, but contains not a single serious secondary work published in Lithuania on the Holocaust from the last two decades. And yet it's published as a serious academic work. It would be as if just to aside, if someone published the history of Vichy France without mentioning a single French language study of the last 20, 30 years and present this as a sort of a something new and, and worthwhile. Uh, I also reviewed recently a book on Reichskommissariat Ostland, a German language collection of articles, which contain the same problems. Uh, there are many details which are incorrect. Details, yes. But they're only incorrect because the authors are unable to access the kind of archives, the kind of material that they would if they'd studied in France or some other country. I want to start this this way. A lot has changed since 1989-1990. And, and what I have here actually is the glasnost period, Western perceptions as a shock to the Lithuanian self-image. The way in which the Holocaust was politicized came during a period of crisis in the Soviet Union. And in the Western media, uh, we can see some things that I want to show you. Uh, that one of the narratives that was common in the West was that these Lithuanians were endangering Perestroika by their nationalistic sort of fantasies and so on. Excuse me, I grab some water here. This is a typical article which argues that, in fact, <coughs> since Lithuanian Grand Duchy conquered part of Russia in the 14th century, the Lithuanians were really a threat to the Moscow. And therefore, the Russians should, should. It was a time when the Gorbachev government actually presented Gorbachev not as a Lenin but as a Lincoln. <laughs> Save the Union. And of course, the term "saving the Union" to an American ear sounds so good, so so positive, so Lincoln-esque. Uh, and so, what you have is this article, "Rush to Vengeance." So the idea was that the Lithuanians did not deserve independence because of the bloody past, specifically collaboration to murder the Jews. Uh, a lot of this information, this was one of the worst articles, which cont contained a number of factual errors that were just sort of come out at you if you read it, uh, with the same kind of idea that the Lithuanians should be quiet and they should let Gorbachev do his liberal reforms, otherwise who knows what would happen. And my favorite though is uh, this. This is the, about the amnesty of 1991, a controversy that was mentioned I think yesterday and also today, uh, in 1991. And, but the important thing is the caption, of course, just to conclude this. Uh, as you see, if you can read the caption, I don't know if you can. But it says, uh, Adolf Hitler salutes a crowd of Lithuanian supporters in 1939. Well, uh, that's sort of like calling the Germans of Sudetenland Czechs. I mean, the people in the picture giving the salute are certainly not Lithuanians. And besides, you see the sign up there says in German, Dieses Land gleich ewig. I'm sure it doesn't say Litauer. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, look, there was this problem. The reason I mention this is the evolving response to this. And I know this from personal experience, and I apologize to make this personalized, but two historians who, I, who are very prominent, I know very well and respect, arrived in New York in 1991 in their face for this. And they come to me and say, oh. and then they had a, a meeting in New York about the Holocaust, and they were stunned by the animosity and the questioning that they received from the Jewish audience. They were utterly unprepared for this. Now, in hindsight of old age and 20 years later, I think that this was a good thing. In hindsight, there was a silver lining to this cloud because it forced people to react in some way. Now, many people reacted purely defensively, true, but others began to say, okay, why is this going on? And therefore, I think it's safe to say that since the 1990s, we've seen in the last 20 years a 
certain expansion of not only interest in Holocaust history, but in Jewish history in general. Uh, I can mention a very recent article that I found very, for example, insightful that could only be written by a Lithuanian scholar in, this country, in, in Lithuania. And it deals with the mid-1930s, um, and I think, well, you probably read it already, about the Neumann's ass case. This was when the Lithuanian government cracked down on the Nazis and collected a memo and arrested them and had a big trial. And just at that time, there's another brief resurgence of Lithuanian Jewish love because the Jews are saying, well, look at the Lithuanians, they're cracking down on the Nazis, very good. Uh, and Smetona publishes a uh, speech in which he criticizes racism as nonsense. And so that's good. You see, the, the whole relationship was always pragmatic uh, between Jews and Lithuanians to a large extent. Then, of course, things got worse in the latter part of the 1930s as this German situation changed. But anyway, this is the kind of work, I think, that, has to, that can be done uh, mainly by people in Lithuania. It is virtually unknown outside the country, this kind of more nuanced, uh, interesting approach. Uh, and three things happened, I think, that expanded the knowledge of, of scholarship. I mentioned this already before times, but I'll just briefly. There were a number of important conferences. The one in Vilnius in 1993, and, the very, and a very important one in 1997 in Nida, which included Dina Parat and Ezra Mendelssohn, two giants of Jewish scholarship. Uh, and the seasort, uh, the, the resort town of Nida was chosen precisely because it was a small place and away from big cities uh, in order not to attract too much attention. Those were the days when that kind of thing was considered uh, when setting up a conference. Um, and then in 1999, uh, there was another conference, and there was a big one in 2002, uh, which uh, included Yehuda Bauer and so on. So th this was one way in which the uh, universe expanded of Holocaust scholarship in the country itself. Of course, and then the historical, all three Baltic countries established historical commissions. They were very, very different one from the other, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Uh, the one in Lithuania actually has published now eight or nine, ten volumes, uh, three or four dealing with them. Nazi period, the others with the Soviet period. It was a controversial commission. Uh, many Jews didn't like it because they didn't like the idea of Soviet and uh, uh, Nazi crimes being evaluated within the same body, although actually as a practical matter, there were two subcommissions which worked entirely independently and did not interact much. Uh, Lithuanians and the emigres didn't like it because they said, look, this is just another uh, commission established because the Jews and Israel and Americans are pressuring Lithuania and they were going to talk a lot, a, a lot about how bad the Lithuanians were during the Nazi period. Uh, so the commission was unpopular at the two extremes, uh, in some sense. Um, now, uh, to conclude about, so, and then there was scholarly publications, a number of which we have already seen and talked about yesterday. Um, there are now, I think if we publish the bibliography of Lithuanian language publications on World War II and the Holocaust, they would reach, and I'm talking about more serious academic articles, not polemical ones but ones in which historical research is, is revised and peer-reviewed, I would say we're talking about at least a hundred or more articles and at least a dozen or so monographic studies uh, compared to what had been. So you see, uh, th this is the first kind of Lithuanian school of historiography because I don't consider the emigre one that I talked to before any serious historiographical school. And of course, during the Soviet period, that was an another matter. Now, I want to completely change gears and, and, uh, uh, about another aspect. Historians can talk to each other at conferences, and that's fine. But historiography would not mean much if there was not an attempt to approach a wider reading public. <coughs> now, here we run into several problems. And I want to highlight one, and I apologize for a very shameless uh, strategy here. I will in, in, inject my own family's history into a narrative to make a point. Uh, and it refers to outside academe. I'm talking about the lived experience of Lithuanian people and why sometimes the Holocaust does not quite resonate in the same way as it does in the West. This is the Ulvenai Cemetery. Uh, my grandparents are buried there, uncles, aunts, cousins, at least a dozen. Uh, it's a small village very close to the Belarus border, very scenic by the way, uh, a typical Catholic ceremony, uh, cemetery of the, of the time, period. As you can see, beyond those forests you see on the far side, already not too far, is the kingdom of uh, Lukashenko, 
the last dictatorship in Europe. And the European Union ends very few miles to the east of here, actually. A uh, very interesting spot. But what's important here is not that. Uh, there are three gravestones in the cemetery. One belongs to the family of Anna Komarovska, who is the grandmother, her daughter Mariana Lidinova, and their children, four children. Um, they are, uh, <coughs> if we can read it here, Tadeo, she's the youngest at four months. Uh, they all died, as you can see, those in the Polish, Tragic Mochnerchen, Barum, Vyashni, and Pokwe. This is a, a part of the country where Polish, Lithuanian, Belarusian identities shift and overlap. Part of the family is called Komarowskas and part of them are Komarowskis. My uh, uncle's wife was a Komarowska, uh, uh, Komarowskite, uh, she would say. Uh, so these are four families in the cemetery, by the way. There's the Sujedovs, uh, Shvedas, Komarowski, and Ulbenas. They're four basically predominant families in the cemetery. They all went to marry, they knew each other, their lands were close. Uh, you see, this is, uh, uh, this is another gravestone. Uh, this is a Lithuanian one. And it, it's, uh, those who know Lithuanian, it's the gravestone of a young man. He was a Shvedas, 19 years old. Uh, also died tragically, as they would use that language. Oh, he was murdered, actually. That's what it means. Uh, they didn't die in an auto accident. Uh, and there's another one. Uh, this is the uh, gravestone of uh, Maria Kamarovskaita. She was wounded on the same day, but she died later. She was 17. Now, wh why do I tell you the story? Uh, and the story goes like this, and I've interviewed local people, including my family members. Uh, unlike some people, I, I, I take their testimony critically. Uh, I know the outlines of the story. I, I don't take every word they say as the gospel. But here's the outline of the story. On that day, uh, there was a firefight between anti-Soviet guerrillas and the Soviet militia. As part of that firefight and the shooting, a couple of the anti-Soviet guerrillas were either wounded or killed, and in revenge, the partisans murdered the family of the leader of the local militia, Stasis Ulpenas. Ulpenas escaped to the nearby town of Varena, or on in Polish, Varena, collected more friends and comrades, returned and began shooting the flames, who he suspected were sympathetic to the anti-Soviet cause, hence the other Shredders. Uh, one of my aunts is a Shredders. Uh, so, uh, and he killed others there very differently. He himself, this killer, Rubinus, the militia man, is buried in the same cemetery, uh, not too far from his rest of his family. He married again later. It's the date that's on the tombstones that's important here, May 8, 1945. This is London on May 8th. I don't think the families in that cemetery had much to celebrate, of course, that day. This is the day of their death. It reminds me of something when I first visited the cemetery in 1974, of what my uncle told me. And translating it from the colloquial Lithuanian, I would say something like this. Uh, he was glad his nephew had come. He said, you see, it was after the war when Alpel broke loose. It took me quite a while to understand how counterintuitive that sentence is to someone who was raised on the films of Steven Spielberg. <coughs> But it is the lived experience of these people. Ethnic Lithuanians, it can be proven statistically. I think I've done some calculations, and right now I think they're about eight or nine times more likely to die from a Soviet bullet between 45 and 53 than during the Second World War. And this is not only the experience of Lithuanians, but also the other two Baltic nations. Now, and I, another point I want to make, this is a statue not far from the cemetery, actually. I'd say it'd be about a 10 minute drive from the place you saw. It's a town called Kirchupis, now Kirchupay, they say. It's a very famous statue, the mother of Kirchupomotna, oh, <laughs> sorry, uh, the mother of Kirchupis. This was a town, 1944, on June 3rd, a German unit arrived and slaughtered about 100, I think 19 people, if I, my memory serves me right, I have it here, but it's 119. They were burned alive. And, 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 surrounded, herded together, burned alive, in retaliation 
for a Soviet guerrilla attack on a nearby German outfit, a German unit which had been passing through. It was ambushed, and this was the revenge. Now, I, I want to make a point here a little bit about how narratives are shaped and how important is this for historiography. The, uh, little, again, east of those forests, not very far, is Belarus. This kind of event, the burnings and the live burnings and the massacres committed by Nazis in Belarus was massive. In Belarus, there are hundreds of such villages all over the country. In fact, Belarus probably, I think, the latest historiography is probably one of the worst places in the 20th century in the world in terms of the violence committed against the civilian population. But in Lithuania, this is the only such instance of that particular kind, massive, that particular type. And so therefore, not surprisingly, the image of the war in Belarus, in Belarus is quite, quite different from that in Lithuania for understandable reasons. Now, in this kind of way, uh, I want to say something that is, is almost, now I realize, is almost sacrilegious. From the Baltic perspective, the war of destruction which, in which the Holocaust occurred, the famous Vernichtungskrieg in Germany, a unique war on the Eastern Front. We shouldn't confuse the two fronts. They are entirely different types of warfare. Uh, it's counterintuitive to the extreme. The war begins in 1941 June as a liberation and ends as destruction. This is the exactly opposite the experience of the Jewish population. Now, this is the problem about experience. I cannot question the experience of people but I do have to question their memories as a historian. Historians deal with evidence. All evidence is critically examined. And so what you have here is a, a, one of the problems in which the narratives and conflicting memories make it difficult for non-Jewish Lithuanians, ethnic Lithuanians today, to internalize the Holocaust as it should be. And when I say it should be, I, 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 I to refer to the point that the Holocaust is the most destructive, uh, worst event in terms of scale and method in the history of the country in modern times. And so you would think that it should occupy an absolutely central place in sort of history, historiography, the memory of the people, the commemoration, the museums, and all of these other formats in which we do history and memory. That hasn't happened yet. And I think that there are two reasons why it hasn't happened. One is, I think, morally neutral in the sense that you have to look at what people experience. And it's very difficult for victims who've experienced one form of suppression to come out of their skins and say, okay, that happened to the other, now I will. In other words, often in Lithuania you have a narrative that says, oh, this happened to them, it didn't happen to me. So I'm not interested. I'm sorry to say also that sometimes is the attitude on the other side as well. Uh, this is, this is their, their narrative, not mine. And so, you know, this is in some part a problem of human nature. Secondly, however, of course, is, is the more difficult issue is that certain uh, uh, things such as, um, uh, let's say, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, the narrative of the double genocide, so-called, that still resonates among some people. I'm glad to say that among the academic, uh, serious academic population, small as it is, this is no longer seriously projected. But I mean, it does resonate in the wider populace. So we have all these things which prevent um, the historiography that is now concentrated on the Holocaust from spreading outwards more to the general society. Now. Uh, a little bit of an aside uh, here, you know, uh, you, you can see this uh, as, as in the way in which separate narratives are use the same data to prove different points. I'll give you just one example, or well, two, maybe would suffice. One is that uh, Lithuanian nationalists, when they look at the anti-Soviet rebellion of 1941 June, uh, and the Buenos internment was part of this, this narrative, they claim 100,000 rebels participated. Well, of course, the number is five times less. This was a totally blown up and false figure. But, however, that same 100,000 figure is mentioned in a book by Sarah, in an article by Sarah Neshamet in Israel. Also, uh, say 100,000, but she meant it not as 100,000 heroes, 
that has 100,000 collaborators. So you, using the same bad data uh, to prove a point. I mean, this is the way in which I guess I should say that uh, statistics are used just like a uh, uh, drunk person uses a lamppost. It's more for support rather than illumination. <laughs> Some way I said years ago. Uh, and you have quite a bit of this. Uh, the other example is, it refers to a place in a plant called Previnishkas. It's a place just outside Kalmas, which was a prison in the interwar period, and is the site of a massacre by the Soviet army in 19, June 26, 1941, as they withdrew. They murdered about 200 people, inmates and guards, at this prison. Uh, they massacred. Um, later on, uh, the, the place was used as a concentration camp under the Nazi occupation as well, and hundreds of people perished there as well. If you read a Lithuanian encyclopedia published in Boston, circa 1970, and you open to the item Previnishkes, you will see a big description of the Soviet massacre with photos and so on, and calls for justice to the victims. Nothing is said about the Germans. Uh, if you open the small Lithuanian encyclopedia, three volumes from the 50s and 60s, and you open to the item of Pravinishkas, you see all about the crimes of the bourgeois nationalists and Nazis in 1941 to 44, and absolutely nothing, of course, about the massacre carried out by the Soviet army in the same place. And so what you have, therefore, it's popular now to speak about this conflict of memories, uh, divided memories, uh, as opposed to a shared history. I'm not quite sure what all that means. And uh, uh, I think that uh, when I was writing this paper and I was looking for a conclusion, I found out that I don't have one. It's because I think this evolving situation is still awaiting some kind of resolution. Uh, I know what I would wish for it to be, and that would be for increased participation in the Lithuanian Academy, uh, universities and so on, for even greater research on the Holocaust, and also the Lithuanian collaboration, about which some very interesting work is being done. I just did finish a, reviewing an article by a young researcher on the demographics of perpetrators, quite interesting. But again, this study could only have been done by someone who knows the actual documentation and can dig into it. It really can't be done by anybody from the outside that much. And uh, the, uh, I think that's happening, and I think that that's progressing. The, uh, and, and by the way, not everyone is in favor of that. Uh, just one last anecdotal thing before I conclude with another thought. Uh, in Jerusalem, in, in February 19, uh, 2009, there was a book exhibit at which we had a panel and we spoke. Uh, fairly contentious and very fairly tough audience uh, about the Holocaust and its remembrance. Uh, and uh, there was a woman from Yan Vashem who got up at one point and said, you know, her basic thrust of her argument, I don't remember word for word, but she said, uh, basically what she said was, I don't know why you Lithuanians are bothering yourself with this stuff. Why are you doing all this research? So, so you just come to Yan Vashem, look at testimonies, read them, and you'll find everything you need to know right there. Now clearly, no serious historian could agree to such an agenda, uh, but uh, again, not everyone is happy with this because I think there are some people who think this is our story and now you're taking it over. I don't believe this, I don't think that's happening. But anyway, I just wanted to point out that one anecdote as a kind of an indication of, uh, I think this is, uh, of how we, uh, you know, how sometimes contentious in, in almost a silly way this thing can become. My last point, I want to conclude the second half of what I wish would happen. It would be, of course, for the reading public, the more educated public, those who still actually read books uh, in, in this planet, uh, would begin to accept this narrative of the Holocaust as a central part of the plain history in three ways. Uh, first, that Jewish history is, after all, the plain history as well. Second, that the Holocaust is the central event of the 20th century in the modern history of the country. And thirdly, a direct and honest evaluation of Lithuanian collaboration and the final solution. These three elements to the broader public, this is a very difficult task so far. And it's going to take, I think, a long time in a very difficult manner. That is not quite as easy as the first part, which is the academic thing. And partly because uh, this, I'll conclude with this little survey, 
Uh, those of you who may know, Vagus is a weekly magazine, quite well respected and, and uh, well read. And in 2006, they surveyed 500 adult respondents with this question, which regime was more inhumane? And uh, uh, this was the result. And uh, I'm sure that if you took that uh, survey in a West European country or the US, you'd get a vastly different answer. But this derives also in part from people's experience as well as other factors. Um, well, you know, like I said, I don't have a conclusion because I only have hopes. <laughs> Uh, this is, uh, I wanted to just bring out some aspects of what has been happening, in my view, in terms of research into the Holocaust uh, in the last half century, specifically the Holocaust in Lithuania, not works with Hilberg and, and, and so on, but in, in the Lithuanian <coughs> context, and uh, uh, what I think are some of the problems of the different approaches to this history. So, thanks for your patience. <laughs>